Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics as we kick off the new calendar year with a ethical bang. Um, my name is Adam Posen. I'm president of the Institute, and it's my distinct pleasure, personally and professionally, to be hosting, chairing today's event with Steve Wiseman and the launch of the book, The Great Trade-Off, Confronting Moral Conflicts in the Era of Globalization. It's a groundbreaking book and a book we're very proud to be showing. Again, it is The Great Trade-Off, Confronting Moral Conflicts in the Era of Globalization, available through our website and on Amazon and fine booksellers near you. Um, Joking aside, uh, we, we owe a big set of thanks to Steve, I'll get to that in a moment, but also to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, which did what every think tank dreams of. They came to us with a set of broad questions and gave us research, funding, and support, and encouraged us to take the time to do it right. Um, and without their leadership and generosity, we would not have had necessarily the guts or the time to do this, um, and it wasn't just Steve's time, although of course primarily that, almost everybody in the Institute and many friends in this audience uh, got involved because we've been trying for several years to think about two closely related aspects of globalization. First, how do we think about the distributional issues beyond the broad theory that if you get gains, you can redistribute them? That is, of course, the economist's baseline you and ultimately has validity, but it is not by any means a sufficient characterization of how the world should work. And second, because our goal, much of our research and much of our purpose is to make globalization not only beneficial but sustainable, and that's a issue of political sustainability which requires moral popular buy-in. And as Steve addresses in the book and we'll hear today, we all have to recognize, as we've done in our work on inclusive capitalism as well, that at following the global financial crisis, there's a lot of understandable anger and questioning of unfettered capitalism, of globalization. I think we believe, I believe it's true, and I believe Steve adds to the argument that simply scapegoating globalization for what happened is a grievous error, but that burden is still upon us to try to tell the truth and appreciate some of the more subtle and important moral quandaries that go with implementing globalization and allowing it to thrive. And that's where the great trade-off confronting moral conflicts in the era of globalization by Stephen Wiseman comes in. We're very privileged today, and it's, of course, a tribute to the subject, a tribute to the Institute, but especially a tribute to the author, that we have two very distinguished discussants who straddle worlds of philanthropy, of scholarship, of policy making, and of finance. Our first discussant today is my, someone I'm proud to say is a colleague, although his empire is a little bigger, uh, Arthur Brooks, the president of AEI, American Enterprise Institute, since 2009. He's also the Beth and Ravenel Curry Scholar in Free Enterprise at AEI. Prior to joining AEI, he was the Louis A. Bantle Professor of Business and Government at Syracuse University and all of us in the academic world knew him as a leading scholar of entrepreneurship, of society and economics, of public finance, and as well as more recently with his notable book on the conservative heart, looking at ethics and economics. And so we're very delighted that Arthur made time out of his busy schedule to be one of our lead discussants today. And similarly, I'm very flattered and grateful to have Steve Ratner with us as our other lead discussant. Steve is, of course, chairman of Willett Advisors, which is the investment arm for former Mayor Bloomberg's money. But of course, he's an economic analyst on MSNBC's Morning Joe. I keep being told that that is the most watched program. I can't seem to get on because I guess Steve's insights make me superfluous. But nonetheless, it's, he helps. Um, and of course, he's a contributing writer to New York Times op-ed page. Again, his career is, goes on much deeper and longer than that and as was counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury during the financial crisis and led the Obama administration's successful effort to restructure the automobile industry, which of course is a critical example of the kinds of places where you not only have managerial and economic trade-offs, but ethical trade-offs of a very complicated sort. So we're just very thrilled 
to have Arthur and Stephen with us today to lead off this discussion. But finally, I will call on my friend and colleague, Stephen Wiseman. Steve, of course, is the Vice President for Publications and Communications here at the Peterson Institute. He joined us in 2008 after a very distinguished career at the New York Times, most recently as Chief International Economics Correspondent. Uh, from 95 to 2002, he was a member of the editorial board. He previously had been Deputy Foreign Editor, Bureau Chief in Tokyo, New Delhi, White House Correspondent, Steve was multifaceted when we brought him in. He had already written the award-winning book on the Great Tax Wars. After he joined us in his copious free time, he came out with the widely read, and deservedly so, editing of Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan's letters. And uh, even though he has a day job as one of the most senior people here, we don't have much hierarchy, but to the extent there is, Steve is one part of it. Uh, helping all our fellows get out their own writing and their own work, he managed somehow to write a book in the copious free time, where again, I do need to thank the Niarcos Foundation for having the vision and the patience and the encouragement of doing interdisciplinary thinking, and we're grateful to them for that support. You're here for the substance. Steve's going to give it to you. Steve, please. Well, thank you, Adam, for that beautiful uh, introduction and for your brilliant uh, leadership here, quite frankly. Nothing has made me more proud than to have uh, earned your confidence as a member of, of your team here. Uh, I must add that um, without Adam's support and, frankly, without his patience, this unusual book uh, would not have happened, and this wonderful event would not have happened, and I thank you all for coming out. I'm really honored by it. As Adam said, this book wouldn't have been written without the generosity of the Niarcos Foundation. I'm happy to add that. I feel very honored by that. And I also want to thank Adam's uh, predecessor and our beloved mentor, Fred Bergston, for his encouragement. A few weeks ago, at a holiday reception, Adam said something uh, that really struck me. Uh, he said that we're drawn to study international economics because we are idealists. We think that an open international economic environment means that countries engaging economically for their mutual benefit and to the benefit of their weakest citizens provides an alternative to war and conflict. And I might add that there's a moral value as well in our attempts to bring clarity and honesty to economic issues here, especially when there's so much oversimplification and exaggeration. So maybe it's not unusual that uh, the Peterson Institute produces a work about economics and morality. This book was conceived years ago, um, as Adam suggested, by a conversation between Fred Bergston and Andreas Dracopoulos at Niarcos. And the result was a question that Fred brought to me. Is globalization moral? Has the increasingly interdependent system of our world economy yielded a, a morally acceptable result? I'm not an economist. Uh, though I occasionally play one. And seriously, uh, I did feel that my journalistic background, um, I could, with using that, I could try to study and maybe synthesize economics with history, politics, psychology, and moral philosophy to help understand the highly charged moral points of view in our contemporary arguments over trade, investment flows, bailouts, financial crises, inequality, economic justice, and the like. Uh, needless to say, we are passing through a time of anxiety over terrorism, immigration, climate change, and support for global, the global marketplace is fading, I think. Hillary Clinton, who once supported trade agreements, now opposes them. Donald Trump claims the U.S. gets a raw deal out of the global economy, though his golf courses, hotels, and properties in Scotland and everywhere else seem to be doing okay. Last year, Pope Francis 
seem to blame capitalism for climate change. So we're entering in also into a period of a renewed debate about trade with the TPP that will highlight these concerns. But even as the world economy struggles to recover, my book concludes or argues that there is a moral as well as a purely economic case for the global marketplace, although uh, it notes that global cooperation is surely needed to continue to set the rules. The fact is that morals have always been integral to the discussion of markets. If you look at some writings of ancient Greeks of the New and Old Testament scripture, you can see that our economic arguments are passionate because they are driven by moral principles. Adam Smith was professor not of economics, obviously, at the University of Glasgow, but of moral philosophy. But the moral case presented in this book is far from uncomplicated, as Adam suggested in his opening remarks. Its predicate, its beginning, is that the global economy has raised the living standards of billions of people, including some of the world's poorest citizens. And with all respect to Thomas Piketty, the evidence suggests that on a global basis, economic inequality is declining. The path-breaking uh, work of Branko Mil Milanovic at the World Bank, and I would add Carolyn Freund, my colleague here, has a forthcoming book about this subject uh, next month. Um, and other scholars illustrates that point. Their work also demonstrates, of course, that as we know, and as Adam mentioned, there's an undeniable moral challenge in the industrialized West, in the US, where families and workers with fewer skills are struggling, especially after the Great Recession. But the proper response to that challenge can't be to beat back globalization, as if we could do that or to slow the pace of technological change, as if we could do that as well, but to spur job creation, reform the tax and immigration system, and prepare workers for the changes that always transform civilizations. A century ago, most Americans earned their living in agriculture. Today, we have to meet uh, changes head on. So the moral case for globalization presented in this book derives from what I have defined as uh, the major ethical values at work. Uh, the four that I discuss in the book and I'll talk a little bit about now are liberty, justice, virtue, the promotion of virtue or virtuous behavior by individuals, countries, and financial institutions. And finally, loyalty, by which I mean the conflict between devotion to one's own country uh, and devotion to uh, all the citizens of the world. Now, when I accepted the challenge of doing this book, I frankly didn't realize that I'd be going down a rabbit hole. Uh, I sought out the wonderful experts here at the Institute and elsewhere. I reread things that I had forgotten I had read in college, and I read many new things that I ne might never have studied. I, my reading went from history of trade, commerce, markets, and capitalism, from Adam Smith to Hugo Grotius, John Maynard Keynes, from papal encyclicals to the Gospels to the Talmud, from John Rawls to Michael Sandel. They're all in the book, along with uh, others like Benjamin Franklin and Max Weber, my uh, beloved Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and to uh, Barack Obama and Paul Ryan. Uh, when Pope Benedict issued his encyclical in 2009, Caritas in Veritate, uh, Charity and Truth about the global financial crisis, I thought, wow, the Vatican has joined everyone else in trying to figure out what happened. How did the greatest catastrophe economically of our time happen? So I went through the whole encyclical. It's more than 30,000 words. I, I don't know how many people read it. 159 footnotes. One Catholic commentator called it a monstrous duck-billed platypus, 
uh, if you read it, you realize that the Pope and his writers were struggling. The encyclical is filled with uh, almost absurd contradictions. Uh, it discusses markets, environment, migration, bioethics, culture, population, of course, sex. Um, I asked several colleagues here to read the thing, and I, maybe we could blog about it. I thought it was an important thing, but nobody was interested. <laughs> so I felt that this kind of gap was some, one that I might be able to fill. And as frankly, as I was writing the book, I came to sympathize with the Pope's um, ghostwriters. There must have been a big committee of them. The subject is complex. There's n there are no absolutes in this. There are only trade-offs. One of the themes of the book is this great quote from Isaiah Berlin, quote, those who rest on comfortable beds of dogma are victims of self-induced myopia, blinkers that may make for commitment but not for understanding what it is to be human. For the Pope or anyone else not an expert to be wrestling, however imperfectly, with economic issues is great. It has to be respected, I hope. I, because I'm not sure if everyone here would agree, but to paraphrase the old saw, economics is too important to be left to the economists. By the way, I ended up beating the Vatican uh, with 629 footnotes. I like to say that readers will find this a sign either of the author's erudition or more likely the author's insecurity. The tension between freedom and social justice is familiar to many of us. It's at the heart of our political debates. I want to start this morning, but however, with a discussion uh, about what I'm calling virtue which is kind of a strange idea, but uh, bear with me. The moral belief that political systems should encourage virtue among citizens was cited by Aristotle. It's as old as that. It was a theme of the Federalist Papers and the founders, the Federalists. And as we know, uh, in recent years, there were all these laws, uh, until fairly recently, uh, requiring virtuous conduct in various spheres, religion, the bedroom, other private spheres. Those have generally fallen away, but encouraging what I came to realize, encouraging virtuous behavior in the marketplace, strange as it may seem, is uh, something on which the left and the right actually seem to agree. My argument is that since Adam Smith the system of market economics has been viewed as predicated on virtuous behavior. The sociologist Max Weber outlined that case in his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He at one point quotes Benjamin Franklin, and remember, it's early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. To me, this belief, and maybe it's faith, um, is deeply felt in America, perhaps more than any place else. And I think that it sustains popular support for our capitalist system, uh, especially uh, and even when that support is tested by crisis. So take the extraordinary intervention by Secretaries Paulson and Geithner and Ben Bernanke and others to rescue the financial institutions in 2008-9, despite what they acknowledged was immoral, if not illegal, behavior by banks and financial institutions, public revulsion over their actions begat both Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, not to mention the big short, which is worth seeing. Larry Summers said a few years ago in an interview, quote, People see economic issues through moral frames, and people think there's an extent to which recessions are punishment for sins, mostly sins of excess. He was trying to analyze why the Obama administration, in Geithner's words, felt that it has saved the country, saved the economy, but lost the country. 
Most people believe instinctively in what economists call moral hazard, and they believe that people who borrow recklessly <laughs> should be punished, and people who lend recklessly should also uh, be punished. And many Germans reacted the same way after Chancellor Merkel supported help for Greece, even though Greece paid a heavy price for that help. The German playwright Rolf Hochhuth wrote at the time, everyone knows Greeks are untrustworthy. Look at Odysseus. Um, so it turns out our politicians don't have a monopoly on, on that kind of racism. But in Germany, some commentators also pointed out that the German word for debt, schuld, is also a word for sin. Actually, one of the more interesting byways that I went on this book was to find out that the equation of debt and sin goes back much further. The early books of the Bible were in Hebrew, um, and uh, debt was defined as a burden that uh, needed to be lifted. But much later, when uh, the writers adopted Aramaic, the uh, word changed to, uh, so the idiom for sin became the actual the same as the word for debt in the commercial sense. Uh, the later books of the Bible and also the Gospels carry this uh, forward, forgive us our debts. Is, um, and from that, the scholars say, evolved the idea that charity to the poor alleviates one's sins. So it was interesting to me that a, an obscure linguistic change uh, nearly 3,000 years ago illustrates how we got to one of the moral foundations of Western civilization and how we approach economics. That's some of what I've tried to do in this book. Now, in exploring these issues, I, I did realize that I'd always been fascinated by the way Americans in particular, always debate economic issues in moral terms. Uh, the first big story I covered in the 1970s at the Times was New York City's brush with bankruptcy. And some of you remember Gerald Ford famously told the city to drop dead, as the headline said. Ford had to change his mind, however, in part because Chancellor Schmidt of Germany and President Giscard told him that a bankrupt New York might jolt the uh, already weak global economy. So you might think that Chancellor Merkel and Presidents Bush and Obama might have sympathized. I also like to think of um, President Reagan, whom I covered uh, in the 1980s, as a kind of poet laureate of uh, capitalism. Some might call him a poet laureate of uh, selfishness, but uh, he always portrayed taxes as a moral issue. I think it's almost unique to America that taxes are debated as a moral issue. He saw them as punitive and stifling virtuous behavior. Reagan based his moralistic view, by the way, not on uh, abstract theories of the Wall Street Journal or AEI, Arthur, but on his experience making movies for Warner Brothers in the 1940s when he felt it made no sense to keep making movies once his income reached the 90% tax bracket and he would be working for the IRS and not himself. So these issues of virtue are just intertwined with how we think our economy works. Um, but turning from virtue, I would say that in moral terms probably the most important underpinning of the market system is still the principle of liberty. The freedom to run a business and in the global economy to buy what you want, invest where you want, trade with whom you want. Milton Friedman argued that no society based on free markets can function without political freedom. Uh, so if globalization is to be defended on moral grounds, you have to start there. On the other hand, the critics of capitalism and business practices justly invoke the principle of justice, distributive justice, and have been doing so since antiquity. In the Middle Ages, 
theologians, Christian theologians, preached the doctrine of a, quote, just price. Adam Smith effectively overturned that doctrine, I think. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, he famously wrote, but from their regard to their own self-interest. So we cherish economic freedom, but we also want our economy to embody a distribution of rewards that is just. In fact, it's a peculiar American trait to adhere to both liberty and justice for all as the Pledge of Allegiance promises. The pledge, incidentally, was written by a socialist preacher and champion of worker rights named Francis Bellamy in 1892. He was trying out for a contest on the 400th anniversary of uh, Columbus uh, arriving in America. I don't say discovery, right? But of course, many economists argue that liberty and justice do conflict. A whole field of study has opened up recently. And we've had presentations here at the Institute by the IMF and elsewhere over whether promotion of distributive justice through regulations, government spending, taxes, impede not only uh, the economy's efficiency, as uh, the economist Arthur Oaken of Brookings suggested uh, some years ago, but also the important principle of liberty as advocated so loudly by political candidates this year, well, every year. The trait of Americans trying to have it both ways has been noticed at least since Tocqueville. In the 1830s, Tocqueville went so far as to say that Americans love justice so much that they would opt for it over liberty, even if justice were to be meted out as a condition of slavery. Um, I think he got many things right. I don't think many of us would agree with that. No discussion of justice can uh, ignore the work of John Rawls, perhaps the most important moral philosopher of the latter part of the 20th century. And I want to conclude by talking about the role of Rawls in my book. First, I am speculating that Rawls might have been puzzled by our single focused interest um, in economic equality, inequality, what President Obama has called the defining challenge of our time. Would Walt Rawls agree? I'm not so sure. Rawls' two famous fundamental principles were an equitable social order must secure basic liberties for citizens and to a just society must ensure that its actions benefit the least well off of its citizens. That's an oversimplification, but I think you're familiar with these arguments. Many economies today, most obviously China and I think also India, have mobilized global markets to elevate the living standard of those least well off. But at the same time, inequality is widened in these places because of even greater benefits accruing to the very rich. Um, some experts, uh, I cite our colleague Nancy Birdsell of the Center for Global Development, uh, wonder whether uh, poor Chinese, for example, might choose greater equality in their society even if it means that they're less well off in absolute terms. Inequality, she and others argue, has the political consequence of marginalizing poor people even if they're better off economically. It's a complex issue. Uh, I would just say, it, this is easy for us to say, this is a trade-off that it's easy for us to talk about on our side of the world. That inequality is increasing in the United States is beyond doubt. But the Congressional Budget Office estimates that Government programs and transfer payments have elevated the incomes of the bottom fifth of the population more than uh, the rest of the population by 50%. Um, 
in the last few decades. These programs are not included in the calculations of Thomas Piketty, and I think they should be, uh, because they point to how we can achieve the Rawlsian sense of justice in the United States. And finally, I come to the issue of loyalty, which is kind of a strange concept. Rawls contends that his principles of justice apply to one's own community, interestingly enough, or one's own nation, and not to other nations or to the world as a whole. He maintains that it's the very, this is very interesting, I thought, beyond a minimal obligation to combat famine and disease and slavery and genocide, big issues, one society is not obliged and may not even have the right to impose its moral principles on another. And trying to do so, he argues, might lead to dangerous coercion. Moral philosophers devoted to the improvement of their own societies are, called, uh, are known as communitarians. And I'm suggesting that Rawls would fit in that category. Many philosophers, such as um, Thomas Pogge of Yale, who's a former student of Rawls, and who spoke here at one of our conferences a few years ago, um, regard that Rawlsian view um, as parochial. Uh, we may feel that those who advocate uh, barriers to trade and investment are short-sighted, self-defeating, but their impulse is based on a genuine communitarian value of protecting their own rather than the, the values of the globe as a whole, and that's a very compelling moral argument. The cause of applying moral principles to protect the entire world is called cosmopolitanism. Socrates said, I am a citizen of the world. He was a cosmopolitan, and, by, and that declaration, Plutarch writes, contributed to the citizens of Athens, indicting him as a traitor. But cosmopolitan moral thinking has led, we can agree, to progress on climate change, disease, so many other ills, world poverty. And I th find that one of the ironies is that visionary cosmopolitan thinkers uh, like Pope Francis or like Thomas Pogge or Peter Singer at Princeton seem to discount the huge fact that I began with in this presentation. That is that the system of globalized market economy with reduced barriers has delivered literally unprecedented benefits to the poor people of the world, meeting Rawls's standard on a global scale. So uh, therein lies the case for globalization, a case that must be made realistically with the realization that moral values like special interests are contradictory and require trade-offs. I conclude with thanks again to Adam for setting the highest standards of economic research at the Institute and the highest moral standards accompanying that research. And I thank my colleagues at the Institute for helping to educate me on this subject and so many other subjects. And I thank you all for your attention and interest and I thank Arthur Brooks and Steve Ratner for honoring me by being here to discuss uh, this book. And so, fire away. Congratulations, Steve, on a terrific book. Uh, and what a beautiful event. Obviously, there's a lot of happiness in this room. Um, your friends know you and they know your work and uh, this is justifiably being lauded as a, as a real achievement. I only wish that this book had been written when I was still teaching at Syracuse. I would have surely assigned it. It's, uh, it's an important achievement that a lot of people should understand. I think that this trade-off between moral concepts and indeed the interplay between morals and markets is something that we we de-emphasize in our, in our modern understanding of economics. I, I want to make it just a couple of remarks to emphasize some things. The book is so comprehensive and so good, 
that there's no reason for me to talk about something that's being left out. Very little is left out. I want to emphasize a couple of things in the book that I think are especially salient and that spoke to me in particular, um, helped me to remember what my own values are as somebody who's working inside the free enterprise movement and is indeed an advocate for, for, for globalization. Um, as president of AEI, um, it's, it's pretty obvious that my sentiments are pro-free enterprise in a very unvarnished way. But indeed, the reason I came to the American Enterprise Institute, the reason I'm in the free enterprise movement, and that I'm an advocate for globalization uh, might sound paradoxical in today's uh, public discussions. And the reason is because poverty is what I care about the most. Uh, the reason I got into this very movement for globalization, what Steve is talking about in this book, was the realization that two billion of our brothers and sisters around the world have been pulled out of desperate starvation level poverty by literally five forces. Globalization, free trade, property rights, the rule of law, and entrepreneurship. Those are the things that did that. Now, we can be for or against the good or bad that we see from parastatal organizations and transnational agencies. That's a different discussion. But no serious set of economists disagrees that those five forces have improved the lot of two billion people on this planet, and that is a profound moral good and I believe it's my job to be a warrior for that, to get the next two billion people. That's why I'm in the movement. This is a point that Steve makes in this book, but in a very nuanced way, because the truth is, if you understand economics and public policy, you also understand that there are trade-offs in everything. The best way for you to lose your credibility as an advocate for something good is to say that there's nothing bad that goes along with it. That's important, and Steve makes it really, really well in this book. By talking about the trade-offs that we see between different moral concepts and how people of good faith who disagree and their emphasis on different moral concepts between fairness and freedom, for example, can reasonably disagree as we set the rules in the global trading system and in global free enterprise. One point that I want to make about morals and markets, however, is this. Because I thought of this as I was looking at this important work. Morals and markets don't just coexist. They exist in an order if markets are to do their most good. The point that I want to make is one that Adam Smith made a long time ago, more than 200 years ago, which is basically this. Morals must come before markets. Now, Adam Smith, and, and when you read the book, you'll see there's a lot of attention paid to Adam Smith, and indeed they came up in Steve's opening remarks. When we learn about Adam Smith today, those of us who are free market economists who are trained in neoclassical price theory, we always talk about the wealth of nations, which is the canonical text that helps us to understand how markets can change lives and indeed organize the whole world without central planning. That was, of course, for those of you who know Adam Smith, not his most important work. Adam Smith understood that the, the book that he published 17 years earlier, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in 1759, he considered that to be a much more impactful and important work. And indeed, he returned to that book and worked on it for the rest of his life. Why was that more important? Because he understood that moral sentiments are that which must be the predicate for functioning markets. We tend to forget that today. We study the structure of markets and look at them as an autonomous moral force. They're not. Our morals come first. They determine whether or not the morally neutral markets are going to be a net force for good or a net force for selfishness and greed. And the bad things that we don't like that have externalities and information asymmetries and monopolies and, and failed public goods, the things that we worry about so much. That comes not just to do with public policy and not just to do with market forces. Fundamentally, that comes from our sense of, of morals. Morals must come before markets. That's my first point, is the order of those two things. Second point that I want to make is the why, not just the what, the why of the prosperity that globalization brings about. Now, it almost seems self-evident self that when, when you, you know, I, I open my remarks by saying that there are five things that pulled two billion people out of poverty, really, Globalization led to prosperity. Prosperity pulled people out of poverty. Isn't that good enough? Well, yes it is if you're only talking about the poor. But when I travel around the United States, I talk a lot on college campuses, 
I see a profound ambivalence about the importance of prosperity for, for us. <laughs> when you see people losing their confidence in the market system and in capitalism and in free enterprise because they say, is that it? Just getting richer? Just being on a, a pathway to greater prosperity? I mean, kids, I have teenage kids. I have a house full of teenagers. Pray for me. And um, they themselves ask, isn't this just a hamster wheel? We have to have an answer, don't we? We have to have an answer about the moral good of prosperity that comes from free enterprise, not just for lifting poor people, poor people out of poverty, which is important, but how to lift ourselves into higher levels of consciousness. Now, Steve talks about the Holy Father a lot. He talks about the Pope, and he talks about Catholic social teaching a lot. I want to talk to you, and, and, and as a devoted Catholic, I appreciate that a lot. But I want to talk to you about another His Holiness. I want to talk to you just for a second about the Dalai Lama. Why? Um, recently, as some of you know, at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, we have a, a major collaboration with the Dalai Lama, with a lot of major religious leaders. And what are we doing? We're bringing them together to talk about the, the morality of the free enterprise system, the, the why, the deep why of capitalism. And getting rid of, ready for one of our collaborations at the Dalai Lama's monastery in Dharamsala, which is in the Himalayan foothills in India, where he's been since being uh, driven out by the communist Chinese. Um, getting ready for that, I was studying as intensively as I could many of his writings uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. And, and one thing really struck me when I was first reading this. It really struck me. He talks about the, the four pillars of a happy life. And what are they? The first two are really intuitive, enlightenment and spirituality. Fine. The third is a little harder to understand. It's worldly satisfaction, by which he says, you have an ethical obligation to enjoy your life. Okay. But the fourth one is completely counterintuitive. The Dalai Lama says that according to Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, the fourth pillar of a happy life is wealth. Wealth. Now, now I read that, and I thought I must have read it wrong or it was mistranslated from the native Tibetan, which is, you know, possible. So I asked him. When I was sitting there at his monastery, I said, Your Holiness, what did you mean that wealth is a secret of happiness? Now, he's a, he's a renunciant Buddhist penniless monk. He has no money. He says that one of the great tyrannies in our civilization is materialism. Right? Now, now, again, when we're talking about globalization, don't talk to me about materialism because we're pulling poor people out of poverty. I've got no time for that. But I do have time for that when we talk about the materialism that's a tyranny in my life and the lives of the people sitting around in this room. So what did you mean by that? And he said, oh, you misunderstand. What? He said, you didn't understand what wealth means. Hmm. I said, your holiness, define wealth for me. And he said... True wealth is the ability to help people a lot. It's hmm. not how we define it. The ability to help other people a lot is the definition of true wealth. Why do I bring it up? Because that's the why of capitalism for us. We have an, a possibility, a privilege, an obligation, a moral obligation to use the blessings of our great society, the system that has come to full fruition here in the United States, not just for us to get richer, but to help other people a lot. We know that the free enterprise system, when it is stewarded by our values and our strength and our confidence as Americans, is a real force for good around the world, not an unvarnished good, which is one of the points that Steve brings up, and I agree and not one that's entirely comprehensive, which is why we have to be advocates for a strong and reliable safety net and a welfare system that works. By the way, one of the greatest achievements of the free enterprise system is the largesse to make that possible. But it is also the case that we have to think about our own um, moral obligations and privileges, how we can build our own best lives. And this is what really brings it into a closed system. What we do with our system that lifts people out of poverty is also the meaning of that system to ourselves. I am fully alive 
if I'm somebody who's blessed with great wealth, only if I'm using it to help other people a lot, according to the Holy Father, I mean, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and probably the Holy, the Holy Father, Pope Francis as well. Um, and that's an important point that I think that helps us to use this really great book, uh, Steve's book, which is very descriptive about what people have thought and how to turn it into something as normative and prescriptive and useful in each one of our lives. I recommend it highly to your interest, and it has benefited me greatly. Thank you, Steve. Well, those were two, uh, two really great talks, and uh, hopefully I can... Add a little something at the end. Um, I think, as Steve said, he and I have been friends for something like 40 years since I, since we both were on the New York Times as young reporters. And I see so many people here who were part of our lives at that point. I, I feel like I'm back at his bar mitzvah, but that's a different, <laughs> uh, a different subject. But I guess it is, it is, um, it is full disclosure that I, no matter what this book said, I would not stand up here and say anything bad about it. But <laughs> having said that. I can say with a completely clear conscience, and I have, a, I have a witness, my wife is here, who's heard me comment on it several times in the last few days as I've been reading it, that I really did think it was an exceptional piece of work. It was obviously well written, because that's what he's been doing for a long time. It was thoughtful, because he's a thoughtful guy, is incredibly researched, as you've heard him and Arthur Brooks uh, describe. And it was balanced. And uh, while I think I have a pretty good idea of what Steve thinks, I think he, he unlike many books you read these days, he was careful to to uh, give us all sides of, of the argument. Um, there's a lot of things in this book that, a huge amount of things that one could talk about, and I, but I am not a moral philosopher, and I'm not even an economist. I guess I'm also an ersatz economist. But I want, so what I wanted to do was just talk about, uh, talk maybe a little closer to the ground, uh, more specifically about uh, one piece of, the, of, the, of a very big puzzle. And let me start just because, uh, just to frame where I'm coming from, that you know, I'd like to think of myself as, m as a cosmopolitan. I certainly buy the idea that globalization and comparative advantage and all the stuff I learned in my classical economics courses work. I'm, I'm certainly prepared to agree that the world as a whole is a much better place because of them. I'm certainly prepared to agree with the idea that those of us who are better off ought to be willing to help those of us who are less well off, wherever they happen to be around the world, rather than thinking of them as uh, simply you know, being a communitarian, but being more of a, of a cosmopolitan. But with all that said, I think we have to be somewhat realistic about the effects that globalization has had. And so I want to particularly talk about America's manufacturing sector, because uh, as you heard, I did spend some time working on the auto task force. and. Before that, I had spent my entire career working with service companies. I don't think I had ever really even been in a manufacturing plant. And working on the auto thing really opened my eyes and brought me to a conclusion, uh, sorry as I am to express it in this temple to free trade, that Ross Perot had a point when he talked about the giant sucking sound and uh, other things. He wasn't completely right, and we can get in all that, but, but, but we can't ignore, I think, some harsh realities. So let's start with the overall uh, all picture. In the first 11 months of 2015, the year that we just ended, we added 2.5 million new jobs in America, really good number. Does anybody here know or want to hazard a guess as to how many of those jobs were in the manufacturing sector? 17,000. So we've all read about the renaissance of manufacturing. We read, including in Steve's book, but in a, again, in a very fair way, you know, about onshoring and all these companies coming back, and it's frankly all BS. It's not happening. Um, we, we obviously, even in a time of significant economic growth here, are not growing our manufacturing uh, sector. Let me talk for a second, uh, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, but let me talk for a second about, about autos. In 2009, at the depths of the recession, at the depths of the auto crisis, Auto employment in the United States, and I'm including parts as well as uh, companies that actually assemble the cars, uh, employed about 560,000 people in this country. By 2013, the number was up to 689,000. That's an increase of 23 percent. You've all read many stories celebrating the success of the revival of the automobile industry, and so it all sounds pretty good, and, and on, by one measure, it is. 
In 2009, Mexico employed 370,000 people in the auto sector. In 2013, Mexico employed 590,000 people in the auto sector. That's an increase of 59%. And those jobs, for the most part, didn't come from China. They didn't come from Europe. They came from one place. In the, and I, when I say came from, I know there's an argument of, well, they didn't actually come, but they could have. They, but in my opinion, many of them would have been here, but for, uh, but for the opening and essentially the opening of that border. Now, let's talk about wages. Wages for the American auto worker peaked in real terms in 2003 at $36.89 a worker. Today, they are $27.51 a worker, which is a drop of 25%. And for many entry-level workers they, in the auto industry, they started less. Uh, in about 2010, uh, Volkswagen opened a plant in Chattanooga, uh, 2,000 jobs. They got thousands and thousands of applicants. Every one of those workers started at $14.50 an hour, which is roughly $30,000 a year. Those are not middle class jobs. They are, at best, lower middle class or working, even working class jobs. And, and just as an aside, if, if uh, anyone wants to wonder why Donald Trump has a considerable amount of support from particularly white males with high school educations, when you look at some of these numbers, um, it shouldn't be all that surprising. Um, let's talk about wages. Since the recession ended in January 2009, total private wages in this country have risen by 1.5%. This is through last August. In health, education, and information, wages are up by just under 3%, so above that 1.5% average. In manufacturing, they're down by 1.5%. In autos, they're down by 12.7%. Last point about this. Average manufacturing wages in the U.S. in 2012 were $35.67 an hour. In Mexico, they were $6.36 an hour. And by the way, if you talk to American auto executives, they will tell you that today productivity in Mexico is at least as high as it is in the U.S. and at times higher. Um, they're also starting to uh, assemble Learjets in Mexico, something that we never thought would be possible. And I could, I could, go, I could go on and on. Now, some people... Um, would like to blame, some people would like to blame technology for the poor state of wages and the poor state of employment and, you know, the coming of the robots and, and all this stuff. I don't have time, I'm not going to take the time, I don't know if I have the time, I'm not going to take it, to, like, delve into my views about technology, but simply to say, I think that that is a bit of a red herring. I'm not saying technology will never be a problem, but I think as you sit here today, it is very hard to find in an economy that added these two and a half million jobs while it was growing by something over 2%, to basically say that there's a huge amount of technology replacing a huge amount of workers. You can't find it in the, you can't find it in the productivity statistics. So where does that leave me uh, from my own point of view? As I said at the beginning, uh, although I may have uh, left as many uh, doubts as believers out there, I do believe in the benefits of globalization, the benefits of trade, but I just simply think that we have to be more realistic about who the losers are. We have all benefited because when we, when we go to a clothing store, probably very little of the clothing we're wearing was made in the United States. Um, Fifty some odd percent of the cars that were sold last year in the United States were made in the United States. The rest were all made somewhere else. We got lower prices because of it. Steve explains that very well in his book. It's, I think, clear to all of us. But amidst all of us winners, and by the way, the people in this room are basically the winners because we're working in the thinking economy rather than the making economy, we have to recognize that the people particularly who are working in the making economy, let alone the people in the thinking economy, which Steve talks about in his book, who may at some point um, feel some of these same kinds of effects, we have to recognize there are a lot of losers. And so what do we do about that? And I'm, I'm not going to try to solve that problem right here except to say, except to mention something. In uh, 2007, Foreign Affairs published a very interesting article by a guy called Matthew Slaughter, who's an economist who was then serving on President Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, and a guy called Ken Sheev, who uh, is a professor of political science, I think, out at Stanford. And they basically went through the whole globalization point, essentially argued that globalization had made the world better, essentially recognized that there were all these losers out there and basically came to the conclusion that the way to solve this, and this relates a little bit, I think, back to what Arthur and Steve were saying, was by what they, and they literally used the word redistribution. 
that essentially if you want if you want to if you want to make the country as a whole better, if you want, want to make the world as a whole better, which is a, a noble aspiration, I think you also have to find ways to make sure people aren't left behind. And I get the point I think you made, Arthur, about all the social welfare programs we have and all the safety net programs we have, and they're not in, obviously, in the wage numbers per se, but I think it's pretty hard to escape the fact that amidst all the winners that there have been from globalization, there have also been a considerable number of losers uh, and it's part, and, and it's it's not only affecting these people economically, but uh, as we go into through this political se uh, season, I think it's tearing at our social fabric as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank you very much, our Steve. Um, this is a great occasion, and. I'm very grateful to everyone for being involved. I have some comments I will make, and in particular, I'm afraid uh, Steve Ratner's comments prompt me to make some, but I will save those for the end. I'll make one observation before opening up to the floor. Um, Arthur talked about, and Steve, of course, emphasized in the book, the idea of the two billion who came out of global poverty, and, and I completely agree, and I think most of us at the Institute wherever we find ourselves on this spectrum of cosmopolitan to communitarian, uh, believe that that has to be the central moral fact of economics in our time. And that it's a point of pride for me that we have, in a sense, the best of the center of the Washington think tanks here. Arthur, of course, representing AEI. Steve is not only, of course, on the board, I believe, of Brookings, but we have Strobe Talbot from across the street, the president of Brookings as well. And I remain hopeful that our three institutions representing the intellectually honest and therefore not driven by partisan views can come together on things like the fact that Mr. Trump is wrong, that Americans should not fear the fact that two billion human beings are no longer in poverty mm -hmm. and this is an achievement. And I view the coming together for this occasion not just as a tribute to Steve and the book, but also to the importance of this topic and the ability of people and institutions of goodwill to come together for such a cause. So thanks to Strobe as well, who played a critical role in advising Steve as this book went forward. Let me now open it up to the floor. For those of you who haven't been with us before, we have three ground rules. Um, one functional thing. Jessica has a mic up front. She will come to you. Or if you're in the back, feel free to go to the standing mic. Do not speak until I recognize you. If I recognize you, whether or not I recognize you, tell us who you are. Third, pretend you're asking a question, not making a speech. That is particularly important on the day when we are invoking the Pope's 35,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me open it up to the floor. Who would like to go first? There's no shy people in this audience, I know. Please, Mary Jo. Thank you. Joe Marie Grease Grauber with New Rules for Global Finance. I have a couple of quick questions. One, how are you defining virtue? I just don't understand your concept, Steve. Um, it's, it seems like uh, an umbrella word in and of itself. Secondly, um, I guess this is, the, this is for Arthur, uh, but the sense of wealth so that we can share how do, is that noblesse oblige, or is that what we do f by working through the common good, which is the role of government, in my understanding? Obviously, I also have my feet in Catholic social teaching up to my hips. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that, but there are really some fundamental things. Do we get wealth so that we choose where it goes, like Bill Gates, or is that something that we as as citizens choose leaders and together we um, pay for the common good services. So go for first. I'll go first. Um, it is an, um, uh, an umbrella word. It's, uh, that's a good word itself. Um, when I was thinking through uh, the idea, starting with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Protestant ethic and uh, capitalism of Max Weber. And by the way, there have been rejoinders uh, uh, such as the Catholic eth ethic and 
uh, uh, and uh, markets uh, and capitalism. Uh, if, you, if you look at all of the uh, traits that those people cite that go into the creation of uh, wealth, it's things like hard work, discipline, uh, uh, saving, you know, early to bed, early to rise, investing uh, carefully. These uh, themes run through uh, American history. Just to pick American history for a second, it really, actually, um, one of the apostle, one of the most eloquent writers uh, on uh, these sets of virtues was Abraham Lincoln. In fact, it was the foundation of the uh, abolition movement that slavery was antithetical because it prevented people from uh, enjoying the fruits of their hard work and discipline. And I came to apply the word virtue to that. I, uh, I'm not sure that anyone else has used it um, to describe that set of behaviors. And I really do think that uh, throughout American politics, there is this feeling that wealth is earned, not just, you know, I'm sure many of us feel, uh, I mean, there, we all recognize wealth is derived from uh, luck and um, many other happenstances, but the belief or the faith that, that wealth is earned through behavior that's commendable is, I think, an important thing to understand about the way we talk about economics and politics in our country. And it helps to explain uh, the politics of the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Hmm. Um, thank you. And, and by the way, Adam, thank you so much for having me here. Th those of you who, have, when you came in, if you saw across the street, there are a bunch of cranes around a building on the corner. That's the new AEI. So sorry, Strobel will be next door. <laughs> um, uh, there goes the neighborhood, as they like to say. Um, it, this really is becoming think tank row. Um, w when we talk about wealth, it's very important not to be tied down by the tyranny of money. Uh, one of the other things that the Dalai Lama and the Pope and, and moral philosophers have always talked about is that wealth is not necessarily denominated in units of money. And, and if we talk about the, the, the meaning of true wealth is the ability to help other people a lot, if you accept that definition, which I like an awful lot, I would say that the Therefore, uh, the reason for freedom is the ability to help people who don't have it. The reason for education is the ability to, to lift other people up through knowledge. So you can denominate wealth in lots and lots and lots of different ways. And, and thank God, we, could, we have it multidimensionally in our lives, everybody who's sitting in here, not just money. Now, when you're talking about money or anything else, what's the best way to help other people a lot? And the answer is... There are lots of ways. There's not one pe person in this room who is such a radical as to say it should all happen through the redistribution through government, or it should all be in private hands and, and distributed through the, 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 the largesse of philanthropists. No. I mean, we all understand that there's a balance here. And one of the great things about the American system, which is a fundamentally balanced philosophy of this, as Steve points out, is that we believe that there are lots of both public and private mechanisms. Now, Ideological diversity means that you're going to have some people who are more on one side of the balance on the ledger between public and private and others and, and there are other parts of it. Indeed, you talk about John Rawls, and, and Rawls was very strong in his view that redistribution simply could not be left adequately to philanthropists themselves who will amass great fortunes. And I would also point out that you can't control where they're going to spend it, nor, by the way, can you control it very well how bureaucrats are going to spend it. But that's another issue. These are the conversations that lend us through a balanced approach to understanding how we truly can help people the most. But here's what I wish. I wish that we were coming to fist fights, ideological in this country, to say, no, I want to help people more my way. <laughs> and that's exactly not the conversation we're having today, which is a source of some regret. Okay. Back mic. Thanks. I'm um, Monica Deboli here at the Peterson Institute. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for a very, very interesting discussion and congratulate Steve on, on what is certainly a fascinating book. Um, the question I have is how should we think about countries in particular regions, and obviously I'm thinking of my region of the world, which is Latin America, where there's been an increasing trend of, you know, governments and societies that have become increasingly 
um, just uncomfortable and actually untrustworthy of markets because they don't deliver the kind of outcomes, or at least that's the perception of some governments in the region. They don't deliver the kind of outcomes that um, one should expect, and hence there's a there's a general trend for growing market, um, um, sorry, government interventionism. Um, how should we think about that, and how should we address that in the context of the issues that you've raised in your book? Adam, help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I want government everywhere, so I shouldn't respond. Please, go ahead. Well, it seems, especially, uh, and, you're, uh, and thank you for your kind words, Monica, uh, more uh, knowledgeable about Latin America than I could ever be, but it seems to be a pendulum, isn't it? I mean, uh, th that has swung back and forth uh, over the last several decades. So I don't know how to answer that in a, in a uh, way that would recommend public policies. I, I do think that, um, you know, we go back and forth. If you just look in the, in the United States as well as Latin America, we swing back and forth between faith and markets. And then when we become dissatisfied with that, we turn the other way. And then perhaps uh, government-dominated uh, economies become dissatisfied with various issues, whether it's corruption or lack of growth. And then they swing back and forth. I, I think it's a, it's a process that, that goes on. I guess that's the best, I'm sorry, uh, way that I can think about it. Steve, do you have any? Not a thing. <laughs> Monica, I, I would like, I would add one quick thing. And, and we, we referred to the, uh, the apostolic exhortation of the Pope and the encyclical. And when you read those documents, if you can stomach it, I mean, getting all the way, they're very long. Yeah. When you read through it, you realize that you're, there's a, a man who's writing who thinks he understands capitalism and doesn't. Well, go to Argentina. They call something capitalism that we don't recognize. It's power. Well, and, it's, the, po and the Pope is Argentinian. Exactly. Well, it turns out the Pope is Argentine. It turns out, and, and so of course, if you say that free enterprise is the raw exercise of power by extra legal and extra market means, you're not going to like it. And if you have a long history of generations, hundreds of years of history of the manipulation of what we would call markets through, through this kind of raw power, you're going to have a kind of a jaundiced view of that. And, and indeed, you haven't had the civil society that made the, 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 the growth of markets in the United States is actually something that reinforces freedom and, and bolsters fairness. You've seen just the opposite in countries where you haven't had the civil society that's made that possible. I think it's but, worth pointing out. There goes the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> just, just, just for a second of balance, then we'll go to Antoine and over here. Um, Monica, I think obviously on the pure technical economics we agree, but as your writing for us, among other places, has pointed out, even under some of the excesses of the Lula and then Dilma regime, there were sustainable differences made in poverty alleviation. And it is fair to say that during the capitalist excess periods of Brazil, the levels of inequality, which there didn't mean just poor people in the US, but absolute poverty of the favelas, was something that was a creeping moral sore that had to be addressed. So where I would just push back at Arthur a little bit, besides beating up on the Argentinians, which is like Europeans beating up on the Greeks, OK, we do that, <laughs> um, is just to suggest that, as Steve says about the complexity of trade-offs, there are more than one form of capitalism out there that have achieved various goals. And not everything that gets labeled free market capitalism such as the way the West was developed in the US with huge government subsidies and handouts, which I know Arthur would have opposed in 1820 had he been <laughs> here, uh, should not delude us about how these balances go. Uh, we have a question over there and then over here. Uh, Antoine van Achtmaal, uh, Steve, thank you for writing this book, which I think is a very necessary book. Um, my question is, isn't there something else at play besides what you call the great trade-off, which I truly think exists? And is what I would call the great distortion. In the sense that what you started with, Max Weber, Protestant ethic, has been, in a sense, been distorted, it seems, by a move toward unwise consumption and too little investment. So the question is, do you think 
that transition has taken place and whether that's a, a real problem. And then uh, to Steve, uh, if there is a great distortion where basically the 1%, people in this room, <laughs> um, can basically lobby and exert their power in a way that is way beyond basically uh, their representation in the population, would that hurt the ability to, and I agree with you that the great uh, uh, out, or uh, let's say the, the great solution or the, the, the for all of this would be a redistribution, but can that distort the ability to do that distribution? Thank you, Antoine. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Well, uh, I don't really address the uh, answer to your question in the book, but I think it's a good question and I agree with it. I mean, there has been a distortion in priorities even within our system and that capitalism depends on, uh, as, a, as I think I understand your question, uh, the investment uh, you know, uh, quotient of, you know, of the economy. So I, I don't want to add much more than that except to say that I look forward to your book in the spring, which I think will be about this. <laughs> this is how we get these people to come to these yeah. events. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Other Steve. Uh, yeah, Antoine, I think broadly speaking, I certainly agree with you that the ability of the 1% or of people of influence and they're presumably of at least some economic means to uh, have a disproportionate influence on policy does make it harder to, uh, to take care of the people who are being hurt. There's, 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 no, I mean, there's no question. Um, I, would just, I would just say two things. First, I think if you actually, and this, this is not meant to be a political commercial, but if you look at what's happened over the last seven years, there actually has been uh, a considerable amount of, of additional redistribution that's gone on. You had Obamacare passed, which we can, you know, it was worth like five lunches, but is fundamentally, in my view, a redistributionist program of getting 12 million people who are uninsured onto insurance uh, and helping others who, who can't afford it. You had tax rates raised. The capital gains rate went from 15% to 23.8% over the last couple of years. The top rate on ordinary income has gone up. There was just some data that the IRS publishes every year on what the effective tax rate is for people at the top. And if you're at the 0.001%, so like that's right up there. Um, I think it's about 1,700 taxpayers. Your tax rate, your average tax rate is about, went up to about 24% last year, which is right back to where it was in 1992 after having dropped down, I think, to maybe 14%. So the rich are paying more. It's, I, I, you know, it's, I, I've seen studies and numbers that suggest that there's almost probably no amount of redistrib no set of tax rates that are probably going to be politically palatable that are going to completely compensate for some of the losses I've talked about. But we've made some progress, but I agree with you there are also some challenges. But I fundamentally think that unless we find a way to do this, that those of us who believe firmly in the free enterprise capitalist system, whatever you want to call it, is the way to ultimately create, to bring all these two billion people out of poverty to create more prosperity, broadly speaking. But unless we find a way to take care of the people who get left behind, then the nature of that free enterprise system is going to be challenged with other, with other systems, and it could end badly. Thank you. This will be the last question. Thanks. Mike Elliott from, uh, from the One Campaign, the anti-poverty group. Uh, absolutely terrific lunch. Thank you all so much. Uh, both, both, Steve, or both Steves and, uh, and Arthur uh, have mentioned the two billion often as sort of part of the, the moral case uh, uh, that, uh, that justifies, explains globalization. We've lifted two billion out of poverty. I guess the question is this. Is there not a risk that over the next 15 years we, don't, we won't do quite as well? We've seen the end of the commodity super cycle. We've seen what Danny Roderick at Harvard calls premature deindustrialization. We've never had successful development anywhere in the world, ever, from Lancashire to Korea, that hasn't had mass labor absorptive manufacturing. I think you can make a case that says technology is changing that equation. Steve touched on this earlier, to the extent that it may not be nearly as easy in the next 15 years to create the jobs in the developing world that have indeed lifted the two billion out of poverty. And if that happens, Steve, 
uh, does your moral judgment change? In other words, if you haven't got on one side of the equation two billion people lifted out of poverty, does the moral case for globalization fall? Before our, I'm going to ask our three panelists to respond because I think it is a very profound question, and we'll do it in reverse order. We'll go Ratner, Brooks, Wiseman. Um, but before I give them a chance to formulate, just let me give you a brief response. The first thing to be noted uh, parochially is that the premature deindustrialization was actually also Ar Arvin Subramanian, who is a fellow here at the Institute. Uh, second and more importantly, um, you, you've got two problems with the statement you just made. Uh, the first is it misrepresents the facts because all the manufacturing in the world didn't mean anything unless they also had markets to trade to and that there was a globally integrated world that they could export to and open opportunities. Doing a huge amount of manufacturing domestically in South Korea or even Japan would not have gotten anybody out of poverty, let alone China. The second thing that I think is incorrect in the way you frame the question, which I think has to be taken into account, is that your premise is a statement that there is something fundamentally damning about globalization that's offset by these two billion. And despite Steve's invocation of the word trade-off and everyone's wisdom in talking about free lunch, it must be seen that we live in a world where most Western countries, with the exception of the U.S., have not seen the kinds of relative deprivation of the working people. And therefore, it is not about globalization. It is about the political failure of the U.S to address its moral obligation to its own citizens. So projecting from the U.S. experience to suggest that something general about globalization I think is an incorrect framing. But please. Steve? Michael, would you like to restate your question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with our host. Um, uh, look, I, 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 with, the, with, with I think Adam's well taken amendments, I do think, I do think if what you're driving at is that the world is growing more slowly, uh, both the industrial world as well as the emerging markets, for a whole set of reasons that, again, would take a whole nother lunch to go through, and that that is something we should worry about in terms of our ability to continue to lift people out of poverty and have uh, as many boats as possible going up. Yeah, I mean, I think that is definitely something to worry about. And, and as you know, many, many very, very distinguished economists have spent a lot of time, whether it's Ben Bernanke or Larry Summers or whoever, and, uh, debating this, the causes, the reasons, and what you do about it, um, but it's 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 pretty scary. And you know, I'm an investor, so I spend my time looking at companies and and their growth prospects and what's happening to their businesses. And it it is very hard to find anything good going on in the world. Oh, look, it's not you know, on a scale of one to ten, it's not a two. We're, we're, the world is growing, the U.S. is growing, even Europe is growing a little bit. Um, but, but in terms of engines of growth, in terms of reasons to be optimistic about a return, and Steve talks a little bit about this in his book, about a return to historic growth rates, uh, it is a little bit scary. And to me, in, uh, at least using the U.S. as my main frame of reference, it's particularly scary for a reason that I alluded to in my remarks, which is the lack of uh, sufficient productivity growth, because without that, you can't really have sustainable, uh, sustainable growth at all. Hmm. Arthur. Hmm. Um, it's a really interesting question because, it, indeed, we, it's a non-testable hypothesis. We don't know whether or not that we've picked all the low-hanging fruit is effectively what we're talking about. And particularly so because we know that of the two, 2 billion or so people that have been pulled out of poverty, uh, approximately 700 million of them have been one country since 1980, which is China, which has not grown out of poverty wholesale because of its wonderful uh, uh, history of, of human rights and openness. It's because of literally the embrace of globalization and free trade. Um, the scary thing about that is that China has a really rocky road ahead of it. There's a very, um, one of my colleagues, Nick Everstadt, is here in the audience, has joined us. And his work shows that 20 years from now, our biggest geopolitical challenge as Americans is going to be managing uh, China's decline. Uh, it's geopolitical decline because of demographics, because of governance, because of uh, military issues, because of economics. Now, again, we don't know because we can't. We don't have a crystal ball in the future. But if that's the case, then we're going to have a we're going to have certainly a headwind against the spread of from the gains of free trade and globalization. To be sure, that what what's encouraging, however, is the prospect of a brand new sort of market for prosperity that we never would have dreamed of when I was a kid. 
I mean, when I was a kid, I was introduced to the concept of global poverty the same way that most of you were, which is a picture in the National Geographic magazine of a kid with flies on his face and a distended belly in sub-Saharan Africa. You remember that picture. That's what, I bet that's what got you into the anti-poverty movement, at least something like that. It, very profound, right? Now, we actually can see the prospect of sub-Saharan Africa being the next place that's not poor. You never would have thought that 20 years ago. That was unthinkable. That, and, and if that happens, that's a, that'll be a big threshold effect in places all over Sub-Saharan Africa. We, look, we've got to work on this together, because if that's the case, all bets are off. The next 2 billion could be 3 billion or 3.5 billion, and in which case we've got an inflection in the other direction, and we're all going to be popping champagne corks, because free enterprise and globalization, free trade, property rights, and the rule of law, it was better than we even thought. And, and whether which of those scenarios occurs, part of it is out of our hands, but part of it is in our hands and, and the way that we fight for which future or which path that we take. Thank you. Steve. Uh, it's a great question, Mike. Um, and I, I'm afraid I can only respond with the platitude that uh, I can't, more than anyone else, figure out what's going to happen uh, with technology and slower growth around the world, but I don't think, and I hope uh, not, that you know our coming to these issues with moral imperatives in mind won't die, and that that will guide us to figure out the solutions. Just as Arthur said, you uh, left journalism to go on this new quest, you know, and, and uh, thinking about poverty in your life. You know we're gonna we're gonna keep uh, at it with these uh, moral questions in mind. So um, uh, th those are my concluding thoughts. And again, thank you all. Before you're released, I'm afraid I'm going to add a couple words. Uh, first off, in thanks, again, um, those of you who know we seek funding and so on may find it a bit extreme how much I'm talking about the Niarcos Foundation, but. I actually, as some of you have heard me say, I admire them greatly because they are both doing facts on the ground, providing a welfare state in Greece where it went away, and at the same time funding research on the long term, or as Steve's ethical terms, they're combining cosmopolitanism and loyalty. And so that is one of the reasons it's not that I actually invoke them, and we're so glad that they are part of this project. But the more important issue I want to go to is just picking up on something Steve Ratner said, and I do not wish to offend our guest any more than he wishes to offend the host. But just, he mentioned jokingly the idea that he's walked into this temple of free trade and raised the issue of manufacturing. I want to point out that this is actually not a temple of free trade. This is a temple of independent, thoughtful economic analysis, which usually leads you to the conclusion of free trade. <laughs> There's an important distinction there. And the important distinction is twofold. First, that it means there are nuances that both Steve, Arthur, and our author today raised, and that we have grappled with repeatedly. So Steve points out about the employment issues in manufacturing. We published a policy brief by Lindsay Oldansky a few months ago documenting how the revival of manufacturing in the U.S went to the corporates and not to the employees. And we documented that and had a discussion about what American competitiveness means in that context. And so it's not about being blind to those facts. But it's also, I just would encourage Steve Ratner as he goes back and rereads the great trade-off, <laughs> <laughs> as well as other works, to realize that the fetishization of any industry, be it autos in the US, rice in Japan, financial services in the UK, or autos, again, in Germany, is actually somewhat immoral. Because it says that the people who happen to be lucky incumbents in that particular industry deserve an entrenched privilege and deserve a skewing of the political process while everyone else is having to adjust. And I know that's not what Steve is advocating, but we have to be very careful here. There's both a moral issue that adjustment has to be spread around the society because adjustment will come. And there's also an economic issue that even as our colleague Robert Lawrence published in a book with us, even countries like Sweden and Germany and France that ran trade surpluses and have very successful manufacturing sectors have seen the same decline in manufacturing employment as the U.S. So playing the game 
is a, it is technology to explain manufacturing employment. It's not technology that explains why French workers and German workers and Swedish workers are better off than their comparable people in America. But manufacturing employment is a function of technology. So let me conclude that we've all said, I think quite rightly, that Steve did something brave, original, and extremely important in writing this book. And we're very grateful and proud to be the publisher of it and to have had the whole community of scholars here who value Steve's wisdom and good spirit so much to engage with him in that wisdom and spirit. And I just want to stress that we at the Institute, again, not as a free trade shop, but as a globalization shop, continue to deal with the ethical issues, whether it was the work Justin Wolfers, Jacob Kierkegaard, and I did on the possibility of raising wages in the US and traded industries, the new book that Steve mentioned that Carolyn Freund has that we will be publishing shortly on entrepreneurship and the rise of wealth in developing markets and how those are inextricable. Arthur, you'll like that one too. <laughs> um, whether it's Arvind Subramanian's notable work on trade development and the environment, whether it's Marcus Nolan's new work that we're about to publish on women and boards around the world and the effect they have on profitability, whether all the work that many of my colleagues have done on sovereign debt restructurings, on governance of the international institutions, whether it's my work and that of Olivier Brown Shards arguing and picking up on where Arthur and Steve were, that recessions are not moral punishments. You have a right and a reason to fight recessions and not just let it tear through societies. We are informed by the ethical perspective. We thank you for keeping us to that, and we thank Steve especially for taking it to a new level. Thank you all very much. Thank you.